Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by your favorite professor, Dr. Ronald Brown. As you can see on the screen, our topic for today is Robert Moses. He is the man who reinvented New York City for the age of the automobile. It's always easy to establish brand new cities like the United States did with Washington, D.C. But it's very difficult to take an old city like the United, like New York City, which goes back to the Dutch period, and adapt it to the age of the automobile. You walk around lower Manhattan, very often you see very narrow streets, which uh, were built for the age of the horse and buggy, and not even a buggy sometimes. And so to take an old city with old buildings and completely redesign it for the age of the automobile or the age of the subway is a very difficult task. Well, that was the task that fell to Robert Moses, one of the great builders of the Empire City. So our outline, early New York City transportation. What was it all about? Urban planning, the great visionaries who built brand new cities or took old cities and totally redesigned them. The arrival of the automobile, how that changed not only New York, but American society. Building the city of the future, Robert Moses had a vision. And it was not just rebuilding New York City, but it was linking New York City to Long Island, to upstate New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and even as far away as California. The person who hated Robert Moses was Jane Jacobs and her accusations that he was not the master builder, but he was the master destroyer. And then finally, planning world cities today. So let's get started. On the left, we see New Amsterdam as it was under the Dutch. The only Broad Street was named Broad Street, or we can see it going east and going north and south on the picture. And that is today Broadway. Why is it called Broadway? Because we can see from the picture, it was a very broad street with traffic, horses, and buggies. Well, the one thing we tend to forget is New York is a city of islands. It's only the Bronx that is on the mainland. but Queens, Brooklyn are all on Long Island. Richmond, or what we call Staten Island, is an island itself. Manhattan is an island. Plus half a dozen other islands are Rikers Island, Governor's Island, Little and Big Brother Island. These were all islands. And so traffic was a major problem. Sure, you could go up and down Manhattan. You could go around Queens or Brooklyn or Staten Island. But as soon as you wanted to go someplace else, you encountered water. And so for most of the history, you had to take a boat to go from Manhattan to New Jersey. So transportation was a major problem for Dutch New Amsterdam beginning in 1624. The English took over in 1667 and exact same, 1665, an exact same problem. And it remained a major problem for most of New York's history, how to get around. Well, until the early 1900s, New York was a city of horses and buggies. Here we see pictures on the left of the Lower East Side. Well, of course, horses are running around, they eat hay, and the streets were covered with cow shit, flies, dead rats. I mean, it was a congested city, to say the least. People sleeping on the streets. Uh, you see the vendors on the right, people selling clothes, selling food, horses and buggies going by. 
uh, men on horses, kids running around playing in the street. So New York was marked from the very beginning as a horse and buggy kind of city. Here we see Fifth Avenue. Look at those beautiful mansions built by the Vanderbilt family. Into the early 1900s, New York was still a city of horses and buggies. So we see these beautiful mansions, many of them which still remain today, but we tend to forget that when they were built, the streets were filled with horses and buggies. And you can imagine the stink that there would be from not only dead horses, like you see on the right with kids playing around it, but all horses peeing and pooping all over the place, dogs and cats and rats filling the street, eating the dead horses. I mean, it was a smelly city, to say the least. It was a congested city. Well, that gradually began to change with the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883. And following that, the consolidation of the five boroughs into one city. So gradually, the islands of New York City began to make links between them. The first was the link between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Later on, we would have bridges linking Queens and Manhattan. Eventually, we would have bridges and tunnels linking Manhattan and New Jersey. The Verrazano Bridge would link Brooklyn and Staten Island while Staten Island was building bridges to New Jersey. So gradually, an integrated transportation system emerged, um, which would link these many islands into one unit. Another major innovation in transportation was the steam engine. And here we see the New York and Harlem Railroad going up and down Manhattan and then crossing over into the Bronx and further north, eventually going the whole way up to Albany. Other lines started linking areas in Queens like Long Island City with the rest of Long Island. And this was a invention which transported people and transported products, no longer relying on horses and buggies. The L of the 1870s, another innovation, elevated trains. See on the left, the trains raised above the highway, but down in the highway, we still see horses and buggies. But gradually, mass transit started replacing horses and buggies. Electric trolleys, like the one on the right with these um, cables above the highway, introduced electricity. Trolley cars on rails. And the bottom picture, you see throngs of people on the streets. You see horses and buggies parked. The jet. We now see electric trolleys going up and down the streets. 1904, with the invention of electricity, it was possible for the transportation to go underground. 1904, the very first subway line opened. On the right, you see one of the very old entrances to the subway that's down near City Hall. So this again started eating into all of those horses and buggies which were thronging the streets and the introduction of mass transit. Well, a new invention was popping up and this was the first automobiles. Here we see Henry Ford and his famous Model T 1908. Well, here again, the engine using gasoline started slowly replacing the horse and buggy. Well, of course, it brought along pollution, brought along speed and accidents, 
but still it was a major improvement where you could not only have Model Ts, but you could start having buses and new mass transit uh, form, 1904, the subway, the trolley, the L, and now in 1908, automobiles. Well, this was a major problem because automobiles were big and they were expensive in the beginning. But you can see from the picture on the right, most of the streets of New York were built for the horse and buggy. Horses and buggies would park, but then they would move. And so you could have maybe a couple horses and buggies going up and down the street. But with the automobile, you needed parking spaces. Automobiles, automobiles were big. They took more space. And so gradually, as the automobile became a major feature, the city had to redevelop itself. It couldn't tear down all the buildings on the picture on the right and widen the highway. They couldn't take over all of the sidewalk because people were pedestrians. They were walking. So how was an old city like New York going to adapt to the new age of the automobile. Well, Robert Moses was the one who came up with a brilliant idea of redesigning New York City. Well, as a very wealthy son of a very wealthy family, he didn't have to worry about work or earning a paycheck, in fact, he never earned a paycheck in his life. He devoted his life to redesigning New York City. Well, of course, before he could do that, he had to study the other great urban planners of history. For example, Peter the Great, Tsar of Russia, built a brand new city, which he named after himself, St. Petersburg, or in Russian, they say Petersburg in 1712. Well, if you look at the plan, you see that the streets are wide, they are straight, they intersect. In many places, it is a grid plan, like it is in Upper Manhattan. And he had his canals, he built his bridges. It was a designed brand new city for the modern age. So there weren't a bunch of old junky wooden buildings scattered around. Everything was built of stone or of brick and with bridges and good transportation to get from one place to the other. DeWitt Clinton, the direct inspiration of Robert Moses, is the person who designed the grid plan, which we see on the right. All of those streets going north and south and east and west. That was the vision of DeWitt Clinton. Efficient transportation. Now, of course, this is 1807, so it was still horses and buggies. But as the city grew in population, the congested area we see at dark color at the bottom of the map, that was New York in 1807. Narrow streets congested traffic, cow and horseshit everywhere, peeing everywhere, dirty. So Rob DeWitt Clinton said, I will build a new city on top of the old city, wide avenues going north and south, narrower streets going east and west, efficiently numbered, First Avenue, Second Avenue, Ninth Avenue, Tenth Avenue, 110th Street, 72nd Street. This was a vision of modern transportation, efficient, quick, north and south, and east and west. Pierre L'Enfant redesigned Paris. He went through this old city over a thousand years old and decided that it was going to be a new city. Well, Pierre Enfant also 
was instrumental in designing a brand new city, the city of Washington, D.C. And here we see it, a grid plan like Manhattan, but also cut through with big boulevards. So you could have intersections where you could put up a statue or put up a monument or a big church or a museum facing an intersection of streets. This was Pierre L'Enfant's contribution, a city for the age of 1800. Good, quick, straight through traffic, but grid plan as well. It was Georges Eugène Haussmann who rebuilt Paris in the 1870s. He was the one who took a knife and cut through these big, beautiful boulevards. This is the famous Champs Elysees, a giant boulevard for horses and buggies, and eventually the first automobiles. But it was lined with trees. There were parks along the street. It was wide. And he designed the buildings on either side, the famous Osmanian architecture. But go behind these big, beautiful buildings lining the street, and you see buildings, some of them 500, 700 years old, narrow streets built for the horse. But Haussmann said, we need a new city. And he said, we're going to build a big Champs Elysees right here. Well, if unfortunately your little house was in the way, he went through with his bulldozers, demolished everything, built brand new buildings to line the street and the hell with the people. If you don't like it, get out. But Paris is going to enter the modern age. Well, another person who is an inspiration to Robert Moses was Le Corbusier who lived from 1887 to 1965. He was the father of these giant housing developments. Everything in its path was destroyed. Giant towers surrounded by parks with ample parking areas linked to supermarkets and churches and museums and whatever. But here again, planning the city of the future. So this was what inspired Robert Moses, taking an old city like New York, drag it, kicking and screaming into the modern world, rebuild an old city of horses and buggies for a new city of millions of automobiles. U.S. News and World Report we proclaimed him the master builder and compared him with Le Corbusier, Osman, Pierre L'Enfant, and DeWitt Clinton and others as the great visionaries of future cities. So, building a city of the future. Robert Moses was ruthless. If a house or an ethnic neighborhood stood in his way, his response was, get out of the way, because behind me are a million automobiles who are going to demolish everything that obstructs their passage. He was responsible for building 50 state parks all over Long Island and upstate New York. So New Yorkers could jump in their car, get on his new freeways and highways and go to Long Island, go up to upstate New York. But he was also concerned about people, 658 playgrounds for children. For him, there were not a lot of playgrounds. Kids were supposed to stay home. But he would go into parks like Central Park and other parks and build areas where children could play and be safe. 416 miles of highways linking New York City with upstate New York, Long Island, and even across into New Jersey. 13 bridges linking the islands, 
two world's fairs. He was responsible for the United Nations complex along the East River and for designing Lincoln Center, the largest concentration of opera, ballet, symphonic orchestra, libraries, of course, all with a giant underground parking garage. So he recognized that the automobile was the wave of the future. There's no way like the American way. Throw the kids in the car, go to the beach, go to a park, go to a shopping mall. This was the age of the automobile. Well, he designed two world's fairs, 1939-1940, and of course, it was the world of tomorrow in uh, Flushing Meadows Park. The theme was the future. Look at the designs, nothing historical there, ultra-modern steel and cement designs. Look at the picture at the bottom on the left, New York World's Fair, unlock the world of tomorrow. And beside that is the house of the future, chairs made of plastic, giant windows, televisions, ultra-modern futuristic designs could almost be a spaceship. So he really was going to drag New Yorkers from their ethnic and ghetto past into a dynamic, glorious future. The age of the ethnic neighborhood, Jewish Lower East Side, Chinatown, the many little Italys, Irish pubs and neighborhood bars, Italian neighborhoods with their little coffee shops and restaurants and pastry shops. Robert Moses said, get out of the ghetto, become an American, join in the future. Don't go looking back to the past in Italy or Russia or China or Ireland or Germany or Poland. Look to the future. So these ethnic neighborhoods for Robert Moses were the enemy. They kept people isolated. They made ghettos within a futuristic city. So he started ruthlessly demolishing these ethnic ghettos. And we still have ethnic ghettos today. Go to Jack, uh, Jackson Heights, it's all Hispanic. Go to Forest Hills, it's Bukharian Jews. Go to Washington Heights, it's Dominicans. Go to Flushing, it's all Asians. But he was the enemy of these, saying, get out of your ghetto and jump aboard the automobile, which is going to take you into the future. So he built Chatham Green, East River Park, Peter Cooper Village, where the people had a nice ultra-modern apartment with flush toilets and sliding windows, even air conditioning. And as you can see in the picture on the right, surrounded by trees. This is Claire Corbusier's dream of the city of the future. It was neat, it was clean, it was modern, it was the living situation of the future. He also invented the parking garage because as more and more people got cars, there was not enough room on the street. So he designed the multi-level parking garages. So each of his massive housing projects had ample parking. In fact, in many places, you couldn't buy an apartment unless you had already signed a contract for a spot in a parking garage. So the cars would be protected. They would be protected from the weather and from thieves in very efficient parking garages. So this was his vision of a city of the automobile. Famous picture on the right is the Cross Bronx Expressway, which he built in 19. 48. 
Look at these cross bridges, tunnel, not tunnels, but cut into the ground, dividing neighborhoods. In fact, it was a big scandal when he built the Cross Bronx Expressway because that area was a heavily Jewish, Eastern European Jewish immigrant neighborhood. And people complained. They said, now I have to walk down the street, cross a big bridge to get to my synagogue. And Robert Moses, who was also Jewish, said, well, it's time to get out of the synagogue business, time to get out of the ghetto and become a modern American, move into an apartment, stop being Jewish or Irish or Italian or German or Chinese and become a modern American. So this is probably one of the most controversial uh, places that he built the Cross Bronx Expressway. In fact, there is a program underway now to bridge over the um, highway to build a bridge over it and to turn it into park space so that once again, you can easily walk from one side to the other. Although most of the Old Jewish neighborhoods that were there have long since uh, disappeared, and now there are other immigrants, but yet it would make the area a little bit more human. He built the Triborough Bridge linking Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. He was the father of the Verrazano Bridge for the first time linking Brooklyn and Staten Island. He planned entire neighborhoods. Here we see Battery Park on the picture on the right, going along the um, river, the Hudson River. Here again, this was a brand new neighborhood that he built by landfill, expanding out into the um, Hudson River. But yet look at the highways, a long highway going north and south, but cutting through it, parking garages, brand new buildings. No longer the pretty brownstones that you see in the middle of the picture. He was building apartment towers. His building complexes included the UN complex in 1952 a huge area along the East River demolished, filled in with ultra-modern apartment blocks, UN headquarters, libraries. Once again, this is not a building, but it is an entire neighborhood, which he demolished all of the smaller buildings there and the factories and put in one united neighborhood. That was his contribution. It was no longer building a house or building one building, but building giant complexes, such as his Peter Cooper village, such as his area of Battery Park, the UN complex, and really one of his most famous, the Lincoln Center complex. Well, look at all the buildings on the, on the left. You see the Metropolitan Opera, New York Philharmonic, the ballet, the public library, the uh, Juilliard School of Music with all of its buildings, New York Public Library. Well, it is an integrated neighborhood. Well, when we look at the picture on the right, we see the fountain. Oh, that looks very pretty. But don't forget, underneath all these buildings is one of the largest parking lots in the world, level and level. He claimed that you could live somewhere on Long Island or the Bronx or New Jersey. You could go out, jump in your car in the middle of the winter, and you wouldn't even have to wear a winter coat because you never went outside. You went from your kitchen into your enclosed garage, got in your nice warm car, drove to Lincoln Center, drove immediately into the parking garage, took the elevator up to the building that you wanted to visit, and you never 
had to wear a winter coat. His 1964-65, again, very future looking. The picture on the right, let's go to the fair. Futurama. Here again, ultra modern architecture, the globe in the middle. I have that very same poster hanging on my wall here from the fair of 64. Once again, looking into the future. He built housing for approximately half a million poor people. The New York Housing Authority of 1934 was another one of his great triumphs. So when he built the Cross Bronx Expressway and expelled thousands of people from their nice little homes, he didn't abandon them. He was not only building playgrounds in the parks, but he was also building housing development, and much of it was for poor people. We see the Ocean Bay apartments on Far Rockaway. Once again, multi-story buildings set in a park setting. He built, he built buildings and surrounded them with trees and gardens, as well as provided ample parking for the people who lived there. Well, while he rebuilt New York City for the age of the automobile, he also stressed that now with the new automobile, it was for the first time possible for New Yorkers living in an apartment to jump in their car and to get out of the city. So he built the FDR highway, the West Side Highway, along the outlines of Manhattan and linked everything with a massive highway system, the parkways as he called them, which he linked New York, the heavily populated areas of Manhattan with the most distant areas in Long Island, upstate New York and across the Hudson River to New Jersey. And so the picture on the left shows this giant network of highways which he built so that you could jump in your car and in a matter of half an hour, you could be in a forested area of the Bronx or New Jersey or at a beach along um, Long Island. Now he called his highways the parkway. In California, they call them freeways, but he called them the parkway because they were two highways, one going in each direction with a park down the middle with trees, with grass, with benches. And so the highway was a park. You can go down some of the parkways on Long Island and you think you are actually in the country. You don't even notice that behind these trees are towns, factories, shopping malls. But even before you get to the beach or the park or wherever you're going on Long Island, you are already back in nature. His famous Jones Beach, summer 1936. The Water Tower, one of the most distinctive landmarks. But once again, he built highways to get there. It was named after the Jones family that owned the land. They were very wealthy family. And of course, they didn't want to give up their land to build a highway and a beach area for the masses. But Robert Moses said, well, if you sell me this land, I will name the beach and the park after this great family. And this is the family that gave us the expression, keeping up with the Joneses, meaning your neighbor gets a bigger car, you get one even bigger. Your wife gets a new fur coat, 
your wife gets a new fur coat with matching boots and a hat. This was keeping up with the Joneses. Well, he named the beach after the Jones family. Well, of course, getting there was half of the trip. He built the famous State Parkway going from Bethpage down through Massapequa, over through uh, Wantok Park, and then down to the Ocean Parkway. So to get there, you had to build highways, had to build expressways, parkways, a southern parkway. You could go from New York, get on the southern parkway through Levittown, get to Massapequa, take one of his highways going south, and you were on the beach in no time. Picture at the top on the right, you see the complex clover leaf highway. So you didn't even have to go through red lights. You could just zip right around and go to the ocean uh, drive or one of the other highways. Well, Jones Beach was more than just going to the beach. He built changing areas, restaurants, he built the great amphitheater where there were concerts where people would go, plenty of parking sp place, spots, and you could literally spend the day and half of the night, daytime at the beach, eating in a restaurant, and then going to a concert or even a Broadway show, which would be uh, performed on Jones Beach for the masses. Well, Robert Moses and all of these cars and bridges and tunnels and uh, housing developments spurred on people like Henry Ford to build more and more automobiles. We look at the Green Line beginning in 1908 with the first Model T going up to World War I, following during World War I, decline in production and then skyrocketing after the First World War. Well, not only was Henry Ford producing millions of cars every year, but look at the price. In 1908, the price was about $1,000 for a Model T, by the year 1924, the price had gone down to about $300. So this was the golden age of the automobile. And Robert Moses was right up front building the bridges, the tunnels, the highways to accommodate all of these millions of automobiles, which were finally taking over the cities of America. Well, automobiles were big industry. They were big business. Whether it was the invention of the Firestone rubber tires so that you could ride comfortably, mobile oil, gas stations, millions of different kinds, models, colors of cars being produced by General Motors. People were proud of the car. Look at those colors. They wanted everybody to see the chrome. They wanted everybody to see the bright color and how happy they were in their Cadillac, their Buick, their Oldsmobile, their Pontiac, their Chevrolet, Gulf gasoline. Texas was a big producer of gasoline. And we started importing gasoline from the Middle East. So car industry was big business. And car infrastructure. I mean, look at this parking lot on the left. I mean, uh, all the cars are black. Gradually, they would, by the 1930s, have multiple colors. The first hamburger joint drive-through restaurant, 
1840 McDonald's in California. Motels sprung up along the highways. These were new kind of lodging. They were not a hotel, which was a big building. You pulled up with your car right in front of your front door. The drive-in movie theaters were popular by 1933. Look at the change of cars, multicolors, very sleek and modern. No longer the old black cars designed by Henry Ford in the beginning, but multicolored automobiles. Gas stations. By 1905, you were having your first refiner's oil company. You had the clover leaf, very first one in 1929, a modern invention for easy changing of direction, not one red light in sight. The giant malls, 1956, where everybody was living in the suburbs, places like Levittown. Even if they lived in Manhattan, they could jump in their car and go out to the malls, which were growing up in the suburbs. California, with its giant uh, freeways, here again, boulevards, broad, for cars as well as parks. The whole system in the city of red lights, stop signs, speed limits, all of these rules and regulations became part of the new system of transportation. Well, of course, there were people who opposed this whole new crazy system of transportation. Jane Jacobs, who was a New Yorker, criticized Robert Moses in her famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Picture on the left shows her standing in front of the buildings that she hated. She was a firm believer in ethnic neighborhoods. African Americans want their neighborhood, Hispanics want their neighborhood, um, the Russian Jews want their neighborhood with their grocery stores, with their music stores, with their churches and synagogues and mosques. She was a firm believer in the ethnic neighborhood, saying that in the ethnic neighborhood, people knew each other look out the window and take care of other people's children. You got to know your neighbors. And when she'd look at these giant towers that Robert Moses and Larco Boussier were building saying, you were afraid of your neighbor. You never got to know your neighbor. You would just say hello in the sub in the elevator, go down, go about your business. And so the fabric of a friendly city was destroyed, she argued. And so she continued this tradition of criticizing Robert Moses. Books like Robert Caro's, The Power Broker, Robert Moses, and The Fall of New York City, arguing that he destroyed more than he created. He wanted a mass homogenized American who was just like everybody else, would jump in his car, lived in his apartment, and rarely interacted with other people. Whereas other people, such as the book on the right, praised Robert Moses as the master builder, making New York City a livable city for the future, dragging it, kicking and screaming into a future. Well, Robert Moses pretty well dismissed people like Jane Jacobs saying, those who can build like me, we build. And those who can't build just sit around and criticize everybody 
who does build. So he considered himself a builder in the tradition of Peter the Great of Russia, in the tradition of Carbusier Osman in Paris. He considered himself a builder. The Museum of the City of New York confronted the two in an exhibit several years ago. Jane Jacobs, who wanted to preserve the ethnic neighborhood and develop mass transit, whereas Robert Moses always wanted to build big, including highways. Well, one of the criticisms that is very real of Robert Moses is by stressing the automobile, highways, parkways, tunnels, bridges, he neglected the subway system. And that's what we're suffering from today, where I live in Queens, the E and the F and the R and the M line uh, are an absolute mess. Whenever I go anywhere by subway, I always have to leave myself at least an extra half hour, if not longer, anticipating subway breakdowns. In fact, I have a big envelope in my backpack, which with what I call subway reading, so that no matter what happens on the subway, I can always pull out my envelope and I have plenty of articles to read. If I have to go a distance, like into Manhattan or to Brooklyn, I always take an empty Coke bottle, one of these plastic Coca-Cola bottles, and I fill it with some red wine because Coca-Cola and red wine are the same color. So I'll be sitting there in a stalled subway train and reading and having a sip of wine. So don't tell the mayor or the police that I do that. But um, here again, that was a major criticism. Under Robert Moses, the subway system deteriorated. Buses were neglected. And he said, this is the age of the individual automobile. So Jane Jacobs lamented that Robert Moses destroyed all of these walkable, livable ethnic neighborhoods. Jews left the Lower East Side and scattered wherever they went. Little Italy today in Lower Manhattan, there's probably not more than 10 Italians who still live there. Today it is a booming Chinese neighborhood, but Robert Moses would predict that eventually the Chinese will intermarry with other Americans. They'll stop going to Chinese restaurants because the kids want hamburgers, that people will assimilate and become American. And so when Robert Moses would destroy rows of brownstones and, or at least plan to destroy entire ethnic neighborhoods, he had a vision of an American, no longer a Jewish immigrant, no longer a Chinese immigrant, no longer Italian immigrants, but Americans. On the right, you see um, Chinatown in Lower Manhattan, which because of new immigration since 1965 has grown in leaps and bounds. But this was considered by Robert Moses a negative characteristic of immigrants. Don't isolate yourself in your Jewish and Chinese and Italian and Russian ghettos, but join in the American melting pot and become Americans first. Now, of course, on the left, you see the picture of Little Italy, which is interesting because you see Italians going to Little Italy, their old ancestral ghetto, and buying and shopping and going to restaurants. But look at the picture on the where you see the young girl doing some shopping, probably Italian origin. But who is running the stand? It is an Asian person. 
And so little Italy joined in the American experience and Robert Moses would say that the new immigrants should also join in the new experience. Now, Robert Moses was not the only one who was fascinated by urban living. Don't forget that today, over half of all the humans on the planet live in giant cities. Farming is now carried out by giant machines and a handful of workers. Well, many cities have been planned as future looking cities. 1909, when Tel Aviv was founded, it was going to be the city of the future. That's what Tel Aviv means. It means a hill of spring. It was not going to be a Jewish ghetto with these rabbis with black hats and curls and strings and sitting in a yeshiva or synagogue praying and reading all day. The founders of Tel Aviv were the new Jews. And we see the layout of Tel Aviv on the right, giant boulevards, intersecting circles, modern life. Today, you see Diesengulf. I mean, there's not a yarmulke or an Orthodox Jew in sight. Tel Aviv was to reject all of these Jewish superstitions and become a nation like every other nation, a city of the future not one looking to the past. So urban planning has a vision, just like Robert Moses was going to create the perfect American, not a ghetto people, but a modern America going to the fairs, going to the beach, going to the shopping mall, going to the opera, a new American, just like founders of Tel Aviv were going to create the new Jew rejecting the strings and curls and, and what they considered superstitions and create a modern city. Lucio Costa and Oscar Niemeyer in Brazil decided that it was time for Brazil to stop being a European country and become a new civilization of its own. This is the capital the new capital of Brazil built in the interior, not on the coast looking to Europe, but in the heart of Brazil. And look at its shape. It is an airplane, some say a butterfly or a bird, but it is something that is flying into the future. It is a future looking city laid out with a giant green area going from the top down to the bottom with the two wings of broad roads, parking garage, apartment blocks, stores, supermarkets, hotels, a brand new planned city. Picture on the right shows the um, uh, Congress of Brazil ultra modern architecture, big open green spaces. Now, unfortunately, when I was there, I was there in the month of January, which is high summer in Brazil. The temperatures were over a hundred degrees, humid. So on the map, that big green space going from the top to the bottom is absolutely beautiful. But if you try to walk on that area very long, you will pass out from sunstroke. You'll be drinking gallons of water. So it's a planned futuristic city, um, very much looking into a new age, but it also has its drawbacks. I must have had heat stroke half a dozen times when I was visiting Brasilia. But it is a visionary city of the future, the type of thing that Robert Moses would be thrilled with. Other countries are building brand new capital cities. On the left, you see Astana, 
the new capital of Kazakhstan, skyscrapers, the Capitol building, monuments, giant open parking areas, new buildings, apartment blocks going up, no little cutesy ethnic neighborhoods. It is a modern futuristic city. On the right is the main mosque of Astana. Here again, blending ultra-modern building techniques and designs with the traditional Muslim or minarets surrounded by a central dome. Here again, building a brand new city out of nothing. I'm sure Robert Moses would have loved to build a new capital of the United States, no longer on the Atlantic Ocean looking to Europe, but in the middle of the country, someplace like Arkansas or Kansas or someplace. Take a huge 100 square miles area, carve it out, and build a brand new city of the future. Well, I don't know if he ever imagined that, but it's the type of thing he would have. So rather than rebuilding an old city like New York for the future, which is what he did, he would have loved to have been able to build a brand new city, such as Brasilia and Brazil, Astana and Kazakhstan, or Abuja, the new capital of Nigeria. Once again, ultra modern, sleek architecture, strange geometric shapes, but yet all surrounded by giant highways, parking garages, apartment blocks, theaters, museums, government buildings. Once again, building a brand new city in the middle of Nigeria to take this giant country into the future. Another futuristic city is Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Once again, a city that doesn't look to the past, but it looks to the future. Look at the tallest building in the world when it was built, tw almost twice as tall as the Empire State Building. That's me on the right, waiting to go up to the top of the Burj Khalifa Tower. I mean, that is an experience. And when you get up to the top, the picture in the middle is what you see. A city built on the Persian Gulf, boats, towers, ultra-modern highways. I almost got arrested because you see the picture at the bottom on the right, you see that highway going over one of the branches of, this, of the Persian Gulf. I decided that I wanted to walk around Dubai, even though I was there when it was about 100 degrees. But there would be a bit of a sidewalk, and then the sidewalk would end. So I'd have to dash across the highway, risking my life. The police stopped me, and they said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going for a walk. And they said, nobody goes for a walk in Dubai. This is a city of automobiles, also with a good public transportation. But you just don't go for a walk. It is a city where you are either in your apartment or in your car going to another building. I found one little park uh, in Dubai behind the hotel which was so crowded with people desperate to sit out under a tree and maybe see a bird. But um, it's just not something you do in the ultra modern type of city, especially in a climate like this. So this is our visit, visit to Robert Moses one of the great visionaries of the United States, dragging the city of New York out of the age of the horse and buggy 
and into the age of the automobile. Well, of course, the automobile is still uh, with us today. The whole issue now is going from gasoline powered automobiles to electric automobiles because one of the side effects of the automobile was global warming and pollution, something that Robert Moses was largely unaware of at the time as were both Americans. But the city that we have today is largely the product of Robert Moses' vision. Now, of course, as I mentioned, people like Jane Jacobs and other people criticized him severely for his failure to appreciate the ethnic neighborhood and the human element beyond the individual. But yet, there's no doubt he was one of the great visionaries of New York City. So that brings us to an end. Thank you very much for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed meeting one of the great New Yorkers, the master builder, Robert Moses. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you sometime in the future.